Well, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure hearing me introduced in both uh, Spanish and English. And I could listen to that all day. It's probably more fun than my presentation. But I'm really delighted to be here. Good morning, Mexico City. Uh, one of these years when this pandemic is over, I hope to come down there and see you all in person. Let me just say that every time that I talk about fake news or write about fake news, the week that I'm doing that, and sometimes even just the day before I'm doing that, something happens in the news which is relevant to what I'm talking or writing about. And so I wasn't surprised last night at one o'clock in the morning here in New York, I was actually just watching the end of Tiger King on Netflix. Uh, and I looked at uh, my Twitter feed and I saw that the US Supreme Court had made a ruling, a five to four ruling, which is preventing the governor of New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo from limiting the number of people who can go into a church or a synagogue. And obviously the reason that the governor of New York State wanted to do that was because people sitting together, even not sitting so close together in a church or a synagogue, and even if they're wearing masks, that's one of the places in which this deadly virus is spread. And the Supreme Court made this decision last night, late last night, on the grounds that a person's freedom, and here in the United States, we have a First Amendment which guarantees certain essential freedoms, the right of people to peaceably assemble, the right of people to speak and the right of the press to publish without government interference. And in the First Amendment, there's also the right to practice one's religion. So the Supreme Court ruled five to four that those rights, those freedoms were more important than what Governor Cuomo wanted to do to protect people's lives. Now, I was very interested in this ruling because as I'll explain to you as uh, I continue talking to you today, and as some of you who have read my work may know, in general, I'm an absolutist when it comes to the First Amendment, meaning I think the government should almost never restrict anyone's right to communicate to peaceably assemble, to practice their religion. But I said the word almost because there is one thing that I do think supersedes those freedoms and that's life itself. So that's really the headline of what I'm going to talk to you about today. And again, it's something that just last night, once again, became front page news, or at least news on Twitter. Now, fake news, as I'm sure you all know, didn't begin with social media. So let me go over certain basics of fake news so we can then see how social media figure into this. And then I'll talk to you about COVID and how that relates to these problems. In the first place, media make mistakes all the time. The New York Times for years had a little word at the bottom of its front page, errata, which as you probably know better than I, because Spanish is closer to Latin than English is to Latin. Errata in Latin means errors. So the New York Times at the bottom of its front page, but almost every day, have a little list of errors that they made. And uh, a few years ago, they thought people might not understand uh, errata, might not understand the Latin, so they just changed it to an English, you know, mistakes we have made. But the point is, 
newspapers, media, like everything human beings do, are not perfect. They and we make mistakes all the time. That, however, is not what fake news is about. Fake news is not about accidental errors that are reported in the news. Fake news is about the deliberate attempt to deceive, an attempt either by, if we're talking about traditional media, the traditional reporter, newspaper, television show, radio broadcaster, or if we're talking about social media by anyone and their grandfather who might like to post online and does. And that also has been a characteristic of media long before Twitter and social media. To get back to the New York Times, something else you'll notice in the New York Times is their logo or motto, which is all the news that's fit to print. Sounds nice, doesn't it? It's a complete lie. What you get in the New York Times is not all the news that's fit to print. What you get in the New York Times is all the news that a small band of editors here at the New York Times deemed fit to print. Big difference between all the news that's fit to print that implies some kind of objective culling of the news. Instead, it's basically the opinion of these professional editors. What goes on the front page? What's printed at all in the New York Times? It's because an editor or editors decide. So all the news that fit to print at the very least is a distortion. And broadcast media are no different. Walter Cronkite, who in the 1970s was judged in a Gallup poll to be the most trusted man in America. Of course, he was up against Richard Nixon, who actually was far better than Donald Trump, but people didn't particularly trust the government back then. And that's one of the reasons why the Gallup poll showed Walter Cronkite, the CBS evening newscaster, as being the most trusted person in America. Well, I loved Walter Cronkite. I grew up listening to Walter Cronkite. I loved his voice. I loved the way he said at the end of every one of his newscasts, and that's the way it is. And that's the way it is. Unfortunately, that was not true either. A more truthful statement would have been, and that's the way a small group of editors here at CBS News thought you should think it is. But that doesn't scan very well. You can't say that as effectively as, and that's the way it is. And so, much as I love Walter Cronkite, and I like the New York Times too, again, Walter Cronkite ended every one of his newscasts with the fake false assertion. And just as the New York Times has to this very day on every one of its editions, all the news that's fit to print. And fake news, of course, did not begin with the New York Times or the CBS Evening News either. And if we had time, we could go back in history. I could take you back and show you many, many examples of fake news throughout history. I'll just mention one. And you can take a look at this. You can search on Abraham Lincoln photograph on Google and put in John Tyler. Here's what that's all about. There's a photograph of Abraham Lincoln from the 1860s. Abraham Lincoln looks pretty good in the photograph. Now, one of the things about Lincoln that a lot of people don't know, he didn't have good posture. He tended to slump, slouch, and so his publicity people couldn't take it after a while. They were trying and trying to get Lincoln to look 
presidential. So what did they do eventually? <laughs> they got a picture of John Tyler and took off John Tyler's head and put Lincoln's head on top of John Tyler's body, what we would today call Photoshopping. And you know, one of the sweet ironies of this is John Tyler was a Southern Senator who disagreed with just about everything Lincoln wanted to do. John Tyler was a slaveholder. He was in favor of the South seceding from the Union. And here is what Lincoln's photographers did. So it's not the end of the world, but you know, this is something that's been going on and sticking with photography. We have O.J. Simpson appearing on a national, on a cover of a national American news magazine, looking a lot darker than he actually looked. So what was that all about? And there the magazine said, hey, no, uh, we didn't mean anything by it. That didn't happen accidentally. Someone at the magazine wanted to make O.J. Simpson look, I don't know, more black and therefore more sinister. Your guess is as good as mine. But what is the case, and not a matter of guessing, is that picture was artificially manipulated. So that photograph in itself was fake news. And again, I could do nothing else in this lecture but talk about history. I'll just give you one more example. As bad as the United States has been in terms of fake news and all the examples I gave you, the country in history that produced more fake news than any other country, and maybe than all other countries combined, was Nazi Germany. During the 1930s, Joseph Goebbels, who got his PhD from the University of Heidelberg in 1922, so he was a sharp guy, he was Adolf Hitler's minister of propaganda and popular enlightenment. I mean, I'll say this for the Nazis, at least they gave this guy a correct title. The title wasn't fake news. That's exactly what Joseph Goebbels was. He was Hitler's minister of propaganda. And one of the things that Goebbels always said and acted upon was that if you're going to lie, you might as well make it as big a lie as possible, as far away from the truth as possible. Because if you make a lie that's close to the truth, it gives people too much of an inkling of what the truth is. And so you're better off just saying something that's totally wrong. Don't make it too close to the truth. And you should repeat it over and over and over again. And this is one of the things that the Nazis used in their propaganda. And we would today call that one of the elements of fake news. In any case, fake news therefore had a long tradition, a long history when we got to the year 2017. And something happened at the beginning of that year in January 2017, which was really a turning point in the history of fake news as well as other aspects of life here in the United States. Donald Trump had just been elected president in 2016. As you all know, he lost the popular vote, but we have a crazy antiquated system called the Electoral College in which each individual state votes for the president. And so it's possible to win the popular vote, but lose the electoral vote. And because Donald Trump had narrow victories in states like Wisconsin and Michigan, he just managed to win those states, but got all of their electoral votes, and that's how he became president. So it's now January 2017, 
Trump has not yet been sworn into office. He's giving a press conference uh, in the lobby of Trump Towers here in Manhattan in New York City. And I don't even remember what he was babbling about. But what I do remember is this. When it came time to take questions and answers, someone raised his hand in the audience. His name is Jim Acosta, and he is still a reporter with CNN and was a reporter then. Trump looks at Acosta and says, I'm not gonna call on you, you're, you're fake news. You're CNN, you're fake news, you're fake news. And went into a typical Trump tirade and then proceeded to call on someone else. Now, not calling on a reporter is something that all presidents have done from time to time. Obviously, there's an antagonism between reporters and political leaders. That's a healthy thing for democracy. No one is surprised by that. But denouncing a major news organization as fake news, that was a very significant development in the historical evolution and impact of fake news. Because what Trump did in that moment, and you know, you never know with Trump, and I'm not a if this is Trump being brilliant or he just had this impulse, but whatever Trump's understanding of human communication was, and however much it was instinctual rather than cognitive, what Trump did at that moment is he turned around the appellation of fake news, the label of fake news from something that was really fake news to something that wasn't fake news. Because why did Trump say CNN is fake news? As we all know, it's because anything that Trump found and finds unwelcome, that to him is fake. There's no such thing as a legitimate criticism of Trump. If you say something that's critical of Donald Trump and you work for a news organization, that adds up to fake news as far as Trump is concerned. So at that moment, what Trump did is he created a taxonomy to use the fancy word in social research. Trump probably doesn't know even what that means. But what Trump did at that moment, knowingly or unknowingly, was to create two kinds of fake news. Real fake news, what Walter Cronkite did, what the photograph, the darkened photograph of OJ was. That's real fake news. But Trump created another kind of fake news, fake fake news. <laughs> Only Trump could do that. Real fake news, which is fake news, fake fake news, which is someone claiming that a real news service, which is what CNN is, and again, CNN makes mistakes. Nobody is saying CNN is perfect. And maybe even sometimes CNN does deliberately misrepresent something. But what Trump did is labeled all of CNN fake news. So that's fake, fake news or phony fake news. So when that happened back in January 2017, I wasn't the least bit surprised as Trump came into office and his presidency proceeded to see this question of fake news move from it was never really on the back burner, but it was not so much every day prominently in the news. And so one of the biggest stories of the past four years has been fake news. And again, two kinds of fake news, real fake news and fake fake news. So that brings us to social media. Another characteristic of Trump, as we all know, is he loves Twitter. Twitter is his medium. Just as radio was FDR's medium, just as television was JFK's medium. 
and television continued as the favored, most effective medium of presidents from JFK through Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton through Barack Obama. And as you probably have seen Barack Obama recently in the last couple of weeks running up to the election in the United States, he's still fabulous on television. Barack Obama, if ever there was a television president, that would be Barack Obama. I mean, he's just as effective Obama is in his way as JFK was back in the 1960s. He's cool, he's comfortable. Donald Trump is quite the opposite. We all know what Donald Trump looks like on television. He doesn't sound very good on television. He's either screaming and yelling or smirking or, you know, he's one of the least effective presidents that ever came on television in the United States. But as we also know about Donald Trump, he loves Twitter. Twitter is his medium. Twitter caters to his impulsive personality. He can tweet out something in a short period of time. People might laugh about his misspelling, his capitalization. Yesterday he tweeted out something that it's his great honor to uh, pardon Michael Flynn. And for some reason in that tweet, he capitalizes the word great and honor. I, I don't know why he capitalized it. This is like Trumpian communication. So Trump loved and still loves Twitter. But that raised, and this is still something that has not yet been settled, a very, very complex and I think fascinating question, but also a question with dangerous consequences. Because Trump, who loves Twitter, lies all the time on Twitter. And there's been an enormous amount of controversy here in the United States, not only about Twitter, but Facebook, Instagram, other social media. And what that controversy has amounted to is something needs to be done about the lies, about the fake news, about the false information that people are exposed to through social media. And it is a serious problem. Marshall McLuhan, years ago in understanding media, as I'm sure some of you know, talked about the ancient Greek myth of narcissist, this, this beautiful young man who was so good looking, he just loved staring at himself. And one day he goes to a little pond and uh, also at that pond is a beautiful Greek nymph who tries to seduce Narcissus, but Narcissus captures sight of his own reflection in the water. And he's so enamored, so much in love with his own reflection that he ignores this beautiful Greek nymph. Now, there are various endings, by the way, to that little ancient Greek myth. Uh, in some endings, it's ju it just ends with Narcissus wrapping his arms around his image figuratively and ignoring the, the poor, uh, beautiful Greek nymph. There are some versions, though, where Narcissus, wanting to hug this beautiful image of himself, falls in the water and drowns. That was always my favorite version, not that I want anybody to drown, but it gets to the danger of being so in love with your own reflection. And McLuhan liked that myth because to him, when we watch television, we were seeing our own reflections. That's why we fall in love with television. We're falling in love with ourselves. So in Understanding Media, he has a little chapter called Narcissus Narcosis. In any case, what McLuhan was talking about 
is the same thing that a few years prior to McLuhan, a Harvard psychologist by the name of Leon Festinger also talked about that. It was, in Festinger's terms, this was something called avoidance of cognitive dissonance. And what that meant in plain English is Festinger in his research found that people push away from them any ideas or opinions that contradict what their beliefs are. And the deeper and more important and prized and beloved their beliefs, the more that people push away anything that contradicts them. So narcissus, narcosis, and avoidance of cognitive dissonance are really the same thing. And they're factors that come into play when we today talk about news bubbles. And so the problem with social media, many critics have said, is it gives us false information. Not only that, it feeds us our own ideas because social media create news bubbles. The algorithms of Facebook, as is well known, basically show you things that Facebook's algorithms know in quotes you looked at previously. They're trying to be helpful. Hey, you know, Levinson, you looked at this picture uh, of a, a hydrangea plant last week. That's right, I did because I was doing some work on my own hydrangea and I wanted to see how much I should prune it back. So Facebook doesn't know why I looked at the hydrangea uh, pictures or articles, but they know that I looked at that. So they'll send me links to new material that they think I'll find interesting. That's how the algorithms work. So if I look at something that is false news, some kind of insane piece of fake news, such as in the run up to the 2016 election, that there was a child predation ring running in the cellar of a pizza place in Washington. And Hillary Clinton was one of the people who were running this ring about as insane a piece of nonsense and fake news and conspiracy theory as you're likely to find. But if you looked at that on Facebook, Facebook then would send you other crazed theories. So this was a serious problem and people were very concerned about it. But one of the things that I think makes this a serious problem is not only the dissemination of fake news to news bubbles on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all the other social media, it's the call for government regulation of these media that gets me even more concerned. Now, I would say right now, if you ask most professors and most well-meaning people, they would tell you that, hey, you know what, we, we gotta do something to control these social media sites, too, too much false information. It's not like the New York Times or the CBS Evening News, where at least there are gatekeepers. There are editors. Remember I said, and that's the way it is. It's really a small group of editors. In communication theory, we call them gatekeepers. And they do things that are not good for the public, like keeping out good information, like the gatekeeper in the publishing house that turned down the book, A Confederacy of Dunces, and then the poor author committed suicide. And then the author's mother took that book to a professor in Louisiana who loved the book, got the university press to publish it. A big publisher then decided to publish it. It became a bestseller. But the gatekeepers, had it been up to them, we would never even know about this book. So I'm not saying at all that the gatekeepers are always good. And in fact, I think Twitter and Facebook are very important revolutionary innovations precisely because they do away with gatekeepers. But 
one of the things that gatekeepers do is they do, when they're alert, keep out false information and conspiracy theories. So this is the reason that Twitter and Facebook are so rife with conspiracy theories. And most reasonable people think we have to do something about that. And some people might think I'm unreasonable because I disagree with the government doing something about that. But if you ask me, I think I'm more reasonable than the so-called reasonable people. Because when you have the government come in and control media, you're not only violating the letter of the First Amendment here in the United States, it says Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or the press. So it's an ipso facto, obvious violation of the First Amendment for the government to step in and control anything that the media are doing. And by the way, as a side note, here in the United States, we have the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. I think that commission was unconstitutional and illegal from the moment it was created. And when the Supreme Court said, no, it's okay, we need this FCC because unlike a newspaper, which you decide when you pick up whether or not you want to turn to this page or that, you can hear something on the radio without even knowing that it's going to be there. But nonetheless, I think that FCC goes right in the face of what the First Amendment is explicitly prohibiting here in the United States. But if ever there was a reason to want to keep the government out of controlling any kind of communication, if ever in all of the history of the United States of America, there was a reason to not want the government to control in any way what any medium, broadcast, social, newspaper, cinematic, streaming, or otherwise does. If ever there was a reason, all you have to do is look at who is in the White House right now. Now, fortunately, he won't be in the White House much longer. But you have someone in the White House who finds any criticism of his fake news and something that should be stopped. And as a matter of fact, Trump has gotten upset because one of the things that Twitter and Facebook have started to do is to label false information as fake news, including Trump's statement, which is fake news. So people here in the United States can say, we have to make some law that restricts Facebook, restricts Twitter, in my view, on not learning one of the most fundamental lessons that anyone who's interested in freedom and communication needs to have learned these past four years. Not everybody who is president of the United States and wields that power is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. John F. Kennedy or Barack Obama. Because for the past four years, we've had someone who not only was that person not in the league of JFK and Obama, that person isn't even in the league of the worst American presidents in history. I mentioned Richard Nixon earlier. By any standard, Donald Trump is far worse than Richard Nixon, far worse than James Buchanan, who did nothing in the lead up to the Civil War in the United States. Pick your president, Andrew Jackson, who massacred Native Americans. He was no great shakes as president, but he also not in the same league as Donald Trump. So there you have your reason not to want any government involvement. But 
this now gets me to what I talked to you about at the very beginning of this talk. Because as we all know, something happened this past year, which by any indication and estimate is the worst pandemic that has hit the world since the incorrectly named Spanish flu a hundred years ago, a little over a hundred years ago. Incorrectly named because actually research shows that the flu originated in Kansas here in the United States. And it, it only became known as the Spanish flu because it, uh, there was an outbreak in Spain and that's when people first started paying attention to it. So incorrectly named, a little piece of fake news, fake labeling right there. But the COVID pandemic has turned all kinds of things on their head. And even before last night's Supreme Court decision, I have been very concerned about one particular kind of fake news that crops up on Twitter and Facebook. And this is very important. Not only is there more than one category of fake news, real fake news versus false fake news, but obviously there are different kinds of fake news in terms of what the fake news is about. And when Donald Trump, as I'm sure most of you have heard, babbled out a couple of months ago at a press conference, I don't know, maybe uh, we should put some uh, you know, disinfectant in us. You know, maybe that will take care. If we can get it inside of us, maybe that will take care of the COVID virus. And then he turns to poor Dr. Burke, right? You, you think that? You know? So, Unfortunately, Trump not only said that, but then doubled down on it. Later, he said it was a joke. That was tweeted out, and it, was, it appeared on Facebook as well. And I don't know exactly where, whoever these people were, it was someplace in the Midwest in the United States, got that information. I think it was on social media, but some woman, I feel sorry for her, she actually, uh, her husband had COVID, actually tried to give him some disinfectant orally and, and the poor guy died and he might have died anyway, but you know, that goes to show you the life and death situation that that kind of fake news can engender. So this leads to the very, very important question that I telegraphed at the beginning of my talk. Is there any principle that's more important than the defense of freedom, which is why I want to keep the government out of any regulation of media? And actually, I've been thinking about this for years in different ways, but it became much more prevalent and closer to the cutting edge right on the surface, as a matter of fact, in this age of COVID and the COVID pandemic. And back in the 1950s, when I was just a little kid, there was a, a ridiculous saying that used to be bandied about, talked about in school and occasionally even on newscasts. It, it was a question. And I don't know if any of you ever heard of that question. And the question was simply, would you rather be red or dead? Now, by red, they weren't talking about the color of red. What they were saying is, would you rather live in a communist regime, like in the Soviet Union, or, you know, would you rather be dead? But they wanted it to rhyme. So they said, would you rather be red than dead? And I was a little kid back then, but I remember thinking when I heard that, what a stupid question. You know, I know what my answer would be. I'd rather be red than dead. Why? Because I don't want to live in a communist state, but hey, at least I'd be alive. Maybe I could escape. Maybe I could overthrow that state. And in fact, that's what happened right in the late 80s when 
you know, the Soviet Union was overthrown and, you know, all the European satellite countries, you know, Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary broke free of Soviet communist control. They didn't all have happy endings, but they all did, you know, better than under the Soviet Union. But back in the 1950s, it's obvious to me, would you rather be red than dead? And there was some like red blood Americans who were saying, no, I'd rather be dead. I'd rather be dead than live in a slave state. I thought that was really the wrong and even idiotic answer. Because if you're alive, you can live to get out of that state. You can live to change that state. You could live to get freedom. If you're dead, you can't do anything anymore because you're dead. So that was back in the 1950s. But here in our age of COVID, after Trump's idiotic point about ingesting bleach and disinfectant, I realize that here again, we have this conflict between which of the freedoms is more important. Freedom to communicate or freedom to live. And so I began to think and still do that the one case where I would like, like to see more government regulation is not just when Twitter and Facebook publish fake news and bizarre and idiotic conspiracy theories, but when they publish false and dangerous medical information. And again, you can sometimes publish that information just by reporting what Trump and some Republicans here in the United States say. You don't really need to wear a mask. Uh, you know, there were some people in the US Senate and you know, House of Representatives, they said, no, I don't need a mask. One of them got sick with COVID. And when asked why he got sick, his answer was, you know, I, I did put on a mask once or twice. Maybe the mask picked up the virus. And when I put on the mask, that's how I caught it. Completely nonsensical in terms of science. So I have become someone who think that even though I don't want any government regulation, I would not necessarily be averse to government regulation to make sure no false information that can endanger people's lives can or should appear on Facebook and Twitter. Now, fortunately, what Facebook and Twitter already have begun doing is labeling fake news as fake news. I think that's a great step in the right direction. And uh, maybe we don't need any government regulation. It's better for Twitter and Facebook to regulate themselves when it comes even to these COVID-19 medical issues and label anything that's fake news or even take it off completely if they deem it to be fake news. Because that kind of fake news can kill people. It can lead to the loss of people's lives. So let me get back to what I said at the very beginning, the Supreme Court decision here in the United States, five to four. Let me since I'm talking about that, in case some of you in Mexico are not aware, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a very progressive justice on the Supreme Court, died a few months ago. And even though there was an election that was upcoming, and even though a lot of people expected that Trump would be voted out of office, the United States Senate because it's currently controlled by Republicans, approved Trump's nomination of a new justice to replace Ginsburg, who is a very conservative justice. And she was the reason why there was a 5-4 decision against Governor Andrew Cuomo's ruling that 
synagogues and churches should limit the number of people who can attend services. In other words, had Ruth Bader Ginsburg still been on the Supreme Court, the ruling would have gone the other way. Significantly, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Roberts, who himself was a Republican appointee, voted with the other three Democratic appointees to not overturn Governor Cuomo's instruction. So how does that all sort out in terms of what I've been talking about? Ordinarily, I would be standing up and applauding any Supreme Court decision here in the United States that came down on the side of freedom of speech and freedom of the press and freedom to peaceably assemble. And by the way, that's another freedom that here in the United States has been under assault during the Trump regime. When people went out to protest the murder of George Floyd, peacefully protesting, in some places, federal agents came in and broke up those demonstrations. That's unconstitutional. If people are peaceably assembling, that's not something the government has a right to stop. But if the reason they're breaking up an assemblage is because there is a pandemic that is raging across the United States and across the world, a pandemic that here in the United States has killed almost 250 million people. That's a huge number of people. Here in the United States, we lost almost 3,000 people on September 11th. I think just last night, we had something like 2,200 deaths here in the United States. One day, deaths in the United States from COVID. So it's getting to the point where we're going to have a September 11th every single day. There is a new vaccine that's coming along, actually more than one vaccine, several vaccines. So maybe in a couple of months, it'll be better. And then we can go back to a world where I and others who don't want the government doing anything, whether on the federal level or the state level, to interfere with people's rights to peaceably assemble, to interfere with people's rights to practice their religion. Because otherwise, in, a, in any other case, were it not for the COVID pandemic, I would have agreed 100% with the Supreme Court decision. But as it is, I think that's a very bad and frankly dumb decision because what's going to happen? By allowing people to congregate in church uh, and in synagogues is more people are going to die. Now, one of my favorite philosophers, John Stuart Mill, a classic libertarian philosopher, is well known for his saying that you, any human being should have the right to swing your arm any way you want, back and forth, but as long as you don't hit the other person's nose. And if you think about that, that's a profound and good and smart way of analyzing the freedom that we are entitled to. We can do whatever we want as long as we don't physically hurt somebody. And when you have a pandemic, and when you have gatherings of people that can lead to other people getting sick, it's not just you. You are endangering other people. You might say, hey, I don't care if I get COVID. I want to go pray in my church or synagogue. I'm willing to make that sacrifice. Well, good for you. But if you pick up COVID from someone in that church and then you go home, and your grandmother is living with you and she gets sick and dies, you killed your grandmother because you wanted to exercise what you see as your God-given right 
guaranteed under the Constitution to worship as you see fit. So to conclude my talk, and then I'll be happy to uh, get any questions from you. To say that we live in a controversial time is an understatement. On the one hand, the First Amendment has never been put to a series of more extreme tests with someone like Trump, President of the United States, lying every day on Twitter. What's Twitter supposed to do? He's the President of the United States, not allow the President to post? I mean, that's unheard of. So they finally are labeling his posts as false. But people are not happy about that either. Other Republicans are saying, no, Twitter shouldn't have the right to do that. I don't like, in principle, Twitter doing that. But if Trump is lying about medical matters, then I think Twitter has no choice but to do that. And so really for the first time that I know of in our history here in America, here in the United States, you have freedom of communication pitted against freedom to live. And in that one exceptional instance where it's life that's at stake, which has been brought home to us because of the number of deaths from COVID-19, there you have the one case in which I agree that the government needs to step in and enforce social distancing, enforce wearing masks. You know, there's a long Supreme Court history upholding the right of people to wear whatever they want to wear. Back in the 1960s, uh, there were students who were not let into school because their hair was too long. The Supreme Court struck that down. You can wear your hair long. You can dress however you want. So why then do I have to wear a mask if I don't want to? Because if your hair is long, or if you're wearing some kind of ridiculous looking shirt that the principal of the school doesn't matter, that doesn't like, that's not going to get anyone sick. But if you don't wear a mask, that could get someone sick. So this is an exception to the rule of what government should do. No, don't tell us what to wear. Don't tell us what to print. Don't tell us what to say. Don't tell us how to pray unless there are human lives at stake. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Levinson. And uh, we have uh, some time to questions and answers from you. Um, so I hope our audience does some questions. I have a first question. It was posted uh, minutes ago. It says, what I'm going to translate it. How should news media deal with fake news or lies? Should they publish them or censor them? If we're talking about social media, as I was saying, I think the best thing to do is to publish them and label them as fake. And, and, and that, but I would say the same is even true with, uh, with traditional media because the problem with censoring anything is this gets back to John Milton's great work, the Areopagitica, in which John Milton, the poet who's best known for writing Paradise Lost, but he also wrote this track defending freedom of expression in which he, Milton said, you have to leave the marketplace of ideas open to everything. If you try to shut out falsity, you might accidentally be shutting out truth because your judgment might be wrong. So if you believe as John Milton does, and I do as well, that by and large, human beings are rational and given enough information, they'll make rational decisions. Not everyone all the time, but the basis of democracy is that most people, most of the time, will make these rational decisions. Then you don't ever wanna close off the marketplace of ideas to anything. So 
if it's medically false information or any kind of information that the medium, Twitter, Facebook, New York Times, knows is false, rather than not publishing it, because maybe they're mistaken, maybe it's true. So publish it, but put a label in that indicates that it's false. I think that's the best way of doing it. Okay, okay, no censorship. Then I have another question from Ernesto Pablo Juarez. Besides cognitive dissonance, what do you think about the role of affect in news reception process in searching for fake news that ease fear in COVID era? How credibility is built by the media from this point of view? What about some objectivity as a central value of journalism? Okay, well, here again, you know, the word objectivity, this is what every traditional news organization says they want to do. This gets back against what I was saying about the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. That is a pretense of objectivity. In fact, it's not real objectivity because the New York Times is still making subjective judgments in deciding what to print and what not to print. So I don't think there's any way out of this. Fox News, I'm not sure if they still say this, but they used to have the saying, Fox News, fair and balanced. Fox News was neither. But you know what? No newscast is. Every newscast has a point of view. Every newscast is therefore subjective. So again, the best that we can do is encourage a diversity of opinions through different media and not try to hold any individual media to some kind of standard of being objective, even though I agree false information can stir up fear, can stir up concern. Again, if it's a medical matter, then I think that needs to be labeled as such as false so people don't get too upset. But if it's a political opinion, no matter how ridiculous that opinion is, I don't think that should be stopped. I mean, I'll give you just a political example. Uh, people didn't like when Trump was saying Joe Biden is old, he's weak, he's seen all, all these ridiculous things that they were saying. But um, if we want to have a world in which someone cannot say that about a presidential candidate, then what about people like me who want to say that Trump is crazy, a lunatic, etc.? We would have a, a sanitized world in which nobody could say anything unpleasant or emotionally provocative about anyone. And I don't think we want that. Okay. Um, let me comment on the next question from Gabriel Perez Salazar. What's your opinion about major TV networks cutting away from Trump's baseless fraud claims last November 10th? Is that what news media should do to deal with what you call fake, fake news? Where's the balance with the right of citizens to listen to what POTUS had to say? Thank you. Well, that's an excellent question. You know, some uh, news uh, operations, rather than cutting away, try to fact check Trump as he was talking, when he, he would say something false and then a voice would come in, or they'd even cut away from Trump for a second, or maybe after Trump finished his talk, they would list a whole bunch of things that Trump said that are false. This is a difficult problem, because I do think, as, as, the, as Gabriel's question points out, that Americans have a right, and for that matter, anyone in the world should have the right to hear what an American president is saying and thinking, given the fact that that person has so much power. So, although to tell you the truth, I and my wife, if we see Trump talking, unless we're in the mood to make fun of him, we usually turn to another station as well, because in my view, how many times can you see this raving lunatic you know, on, on television? After a while, it gets annoying. It's not even funny anymore. But I do think, to answer the question, that news operations in general have an obligation to indeed present what an elected president is saying. But they don't have an obligation to present it without criticism without fact-checking it and labeling it. 
Okay. Okay, our next questions. Um, is there a future for fake news in the US after Donald Trump? Is this, this misinformation infrastructure still alive? I think uh, there's always a future for fake news because there are people who like to peddle lies, uh, ranging from making someone look a, a little darker or maybe better in a photograph to leaving out some information if you're writing something in favor of someone and you know that something negative happened to that person you don't put that into your report i mean this is human nature so there's always going to be some fake news mixed into the real news what i do think is the case as a result of trump and the high profile that trump has given fake news is that people are going to be much more vigilant about pointing out when something is fake news. And I think that's a good thing. By the way, one of the things that we can now do, which people before never could do, is if we see something, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, or anywhere, and it strikes us as being slightly off, like maybe a report that someone died or anything, we can very easily check other sources. And it's very rare that the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, NBC, Fox News, all those diverse sources here in the United States are going to print the same false information. Usually fake news and false reports crop up in one place and the other media are very quick to identify that as fake. And I think that's what our future will look like. Okay. So we have a lot of more questions, but the time's up for this session. Thank you very much, Professor Levinson, for your insights, for your philosophical and historical perspective. And this, I really enjoyed it a lot. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. And listen, if you have questions for me, uh, I am at Paul Lev on Twitter, P-A-U-L-L-E-V. Just tweet me a question, and I promise you I'll answer you. And my answer won't be fake news. It'll be the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was a great honor to have you here, Paul, and we're going to share with all our members your uh, Twitter uh, um, so they can be in contact with you. Eh, quiero agradecer a nuestro invitado, a Paul Levinson, en nombre de nuestra asociación, nuestra Asociación Mexicana de Investigadores de la Comunicación. Compartimos contigo, Paul, este reconocimiento que hoy te ofrecemos de manera virtual, pero que espero próximamente podamos saludarte, darte un fuerte abrazo y compartirlo físicamente también contigo. Muchísimas gracias, Paul, por haber estado aquí en nuestra conferencia magistral The Truth About Fake News, A Matter of Life and Death and COVID. Thank you, Paul.